Hello again. I was um, thinking the other day about podcasts, and a lot of a lot of the podcasts that I've shared with you uh, include tips for photography and, and ways you can improve. And then I was thinking back to my own experience, and I, and I began to think, well, what were the things that made a big difference for me, and the things that happened with my photography that allowed me to what, make what felt felt like a leap from where I had been to somewhere different, where I was suddenly. Uh, able to shoot images that I thought were much, much better and much closer to um, what I wanted to achieve or I wanted to go with my photography. So I've identified five things, some of which I know for sure come up with other people, some I'm not so sure about, but I'm sure they do. I'm sure some of you listening in will um, will have had the same experience or maybe I'll touch on something that you're struggling with and there may be an answer for you in what I'm about to share. So the first one, there are five things. So the first one is using shutter speed. And I remember going back years now, this is in the days of film, and um, I, I, I've been taking, I'd been doing photography for a few years uh, as a, a sort of pastime. When I was quite young, I was working, I was just doing photography as an enjoyment thing. And I used to like going to air shows, and a lot of the air shows I went to had propeller-driven aircraft. So my impulse was to just use the fastest, the fastest possible shutter speed. But when I got the photos back, because they go off to a lab and all of that, I used to, and quite often I'd use slide film, so that would definitely have to be posted away to Kodak at the time. But when the pictures came back, they were very static. Um, I'd absolutely frozen everything. I'd frozen the propeller. The aircraft was frozen. If there was any kind of background that wasn't the sky, that would be very sharp and um, frozen as well. But the um, the aircraft looked like they could have been models. If you think of, I don't know if those of you who are kids, maybe around the same time that I was, we, some of us would hang um, aircraft models from the ceiling or have aircraft models around and that to me is what the photographs look like there was no movement in there so I began to experiment with different shutter speeds so I didn't use I mean there wasn't YouTube or anything like that anyway and I'd occasionally get hold of a photography book but a lot of it I just worked out on my own and um, I remember I'd take a photograph I'd have a little note notebook I'd write down for a particular frame, uh, what the settings were that were on my camera, because it was all manual back then. And um, when the prints came back, I would start looking at what worked and what didn't. And basically, uh, my kind of go-to shutter speed for aircraft shots was 1 125th of a second. And what would happen um, is that you would get movement in the propeller, but... Uh, but you'd have a nice sharp aircraft if you panned with it. So that was the other trick to that. When you, as you lowered the shutter speed, it became more important to pan accurately. And that for me is where having a motor drive really came into its own. So again, with film cameras, you, you didn't do these really long bursts that you can do now with digital um, cameras because at best you had 36 frames to play with, um, with a, a new roll of film. So you couldn't afford to take lots of long bursts. So I do bursts of three or four, but all the time I was panning. And I often find that my first frame was a little bit, not quite as sharp, but once I'd practiced um, with it, I could pan with an aircraft and have that movement in the propeller. So there was a slight blurring of the propeller. The aircraft was nice and sharp. And if there was background as well, that, that was really good because sometimes these guys who are flying... Uh, would do a fairly low pass over the runway. But if you were in the right spot, you'd get a, a something in the background, whether it was trees or hedges or whatever, but that would all be blurring. So those pictures just, for me, came alive with that movement. So one of the things I talk about on um, courses or if I'm mentoring anybody is to, as a rule of thumb, if you think of thousandths of a second, so one one thousandth, four one thousandths, whatever it might be, they will tend to freeze the action. Now, I use that sort of shutter speed if I'm photographing things like a humpback whale breaching because I really want to freeze that moment. Um, I love, for me, a good shot is where I've got, you can see the individual individual droplets of water coming off the animal. So you achieve that by shooting in thousandths of a second. 
where you want some sort of a movement, and this isn't just aircraft, but I've, I've done it at motor racing. I went to, um, uh, I've been to a few motor racing things uh, like Le Mans type events and also uh, one Formula One event in Melbourne uh, years ago now. But I would try and get near a spot where the cars would have to slow down. So for Formula One, it tended to be at the exit of the um, uh, the service area where they're going for a pit stop. And um, at that, although they're coming out fast, they're relatively slow compared to anything belting down the straights. So you had, and, and the reason for doing that and getting them when they're slower, you can still get that blurry background. You can get that at quite a, a slow speed of the vehicle. Uh, you just set your shutter speed appropriately to get a, a certain distance of movement in the frame. And um, But for them, though, it's easier to pan. It's easier to sort of just twist your body. You've got your focal length right, your depth of field is correct, and then you just twist your body and shoot. And if you get it right, you'll bang on the vehicle. And even the tyres rotate, you know, the wheels rotate, and you get that blurring of the any writing on the tyres, that sort of thing. Your background's all blurry, but your vehicle is nice and sharp. If you're lucky, you've even got a nice, sharp view of the driver um, or the pilot in the case of um, aircraft. So for me, understanding and mastering, I guess, shutter speed was really important. And then if you go slower than hundredths of a second, so that was where I tend to be for that kind of shot, as you go to tenths of a a second and then down to full seconds, you're definitely in the area where you get that more ethereal um, shot that people often shoot of rivers and waterfalls and things like that, where you actually want it to all blur together. So you get, a, again, a completely d- d- different perspective of the subject. So for me, kind of cracking shutter speed and just understanding how I could get different effects by varying the shutter speed, that for me was definitely a big step forward. And it meant that when I went to events where I wanted some movement, that could also be you know, you know soccer or rugby or anything like that as well, anything where people are playing. Once you understand how shutter speed works and how to get a particular effect – then you can shoot quite a variety of different shots of the same subject. And and they are all different. They all stand out. They mean something different. So that was the first one, that shutter speed. The second one was aperture and depth of field. And even now when I'm I'm talking to people, I think probably the most, or the, the question that comes up most often is how do I get a sharp subject and the back, the background out of focus? Well, that's all to do with aperture and how you set that aperture. And of course, that controls how much light is coming in to the uh, the sensor or the, the film uh, when you hit that shutter button. So aperture just allows you to choose how much of the frame, if you like, how much of the subject and the distance in front of the subject and behind the subject remains in focus. And that's useful in the case of wildlife and particularly things like whales. You don't always know where they're going to pop up if they've been underwater and they might breach. You, you might have a fair idea if you've been doing it for a while, but you can never be absolutely sure because each animal is different. And, um, you know, I, I don't think you can pretend to know um, unless you're lucky enough to see it coming up because sometimes you see just a white area coming up. It's sort of pale green and then it, it, the, the whale will break the surface. But usually you're having to make an educated guess on where that whale is likely to come up. And that's where you set your focal distance, but you need to have an adequate um, uh, depth of field around that that focal point to make sure that if the whale doesn't come up exactly where you've set your focus, that your uh, it, it still remains in focus as you shoot it. Otherwise, you get a nice blurry picture, which, you know, might be what you want. That's fine. But if you're looking for something sharp, then you really need to understand aperture and how you set your focal point and your, your kind of... I think of it as a box that's where everything's in focus and then things outside of that box are not going to be in focus. So again, understanding depth of field allowed me to get a lot more creative with just the feel of the picture and also how you draw the viewer's eye to the subject. If if part of the picture is out of focus, um, the viewer might look at that area initially, but their eye will always be drawn back to whatever's in focus in that picture. So that's how you begin to... I suppose manipulate in a good way, but it, it, you start to manipulate the experience that somebody has looking at your work. So aperture is another thing that's very important. Um, composition was the third thing that um, occurred to me because, again, most people when they start, they'll just stick the subject in the centre of the um, uh, 
the viewfinder and take the shot there. And they're, they're kind of these are snapshots to me. What when I was growing up, what we'd refer to as snapshots. They were pretty predictable. Um, I remember <laughs> my father when he was around. He would tend to have the subject there, and for him, a good portrait was you could see that the subject was right in the middle of the frame, and if the, and you'd have the full body there and probably some distance away, so there'd be quite a small um, picture in the in the frame, and that was um, a good portrait. And in fact, funnily enough, when and that was true of my family, and then um, my father died when I was quite young, and I took a photograph of him not long before he died, actually, and I just um, I dropped into my parents' home and. Um, he was just sitting at the table and my father was very photogenic. So I just took a kind of head and shoulders picture of him. And when I showed, I remember showing my mother uh, when I got the print back, she really didn't like it because to her, um, a, a good portrait shot was this thing of, it's like the old firing squad shots. Everybody lines up against the wall and you shoot them. But then after he died, that was the picture that everybody wanted because there was that um connection you could clearly see him you could see his eyes that's always the thing to focus on and um, you could get something of his personality in that shot so how you compose an image and it's not just how big the subject is in the frame but where you put it um, if you don't know the rule of thirds it's a very good um, composition technique to start with because you start putting the subject somewhere that's not the middle of the frame and then you start to open up the use of space, the use of other elements in the photograph that might give you leading lines. So again, you're, you're coming back to changing the experience that somebody has looking at that photograph. And if you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then I suggest you go out and take maybe three photographs. One of a subject, whatever it is, but have it dead center in the middle of the viewfinder. Then just shoot the same subject again, but move to but just change the position of the subject so that they're, they're off in the left hand side of the frame and then change it again so they're then in the right hand fr- side of the frame. So that's a very, a very simple thing to do. But have a look at the photographs and see what the difference is. And I think you'll find the offset ones are often much more interesting. Um, I've shared this before, but I heard a definition of a good photograph from somebody, I've forgotten the name of the photographer, but they said basically the longer somebody spends looking at the photograph, uh, the better it is, or looking at your image, the better it is. So um, this is one way to change the experience, have people look at that photograph for much longer. The fourth thing is what I'll, what I'll refer to as uh, mood. And what I mean by that is that if you've got a photograph of somebody and it's brightly lit, they're looking straight at you. You know, again, it's fine. But what happens if you change the lighting, if you make it darker? So part of their face might be hidden. Um, what happens if you um, change the contrast on the photograph? And I find this particularly effective with black and white. If you make it quite a contrasty shot, Again, try this for yourself, but for me, the experience of looking at that photograph, I get more of an emotional response to it. It triggers more of an emotional response to me. And I think uh, when you start thinking about the most powerful photographs uh, that have been shot in the history of photography, you know, over over all of the years, the what, century and a half that we've had now of um, photography, in fact, yeah, going back uh, maybe a little bit longer than that, um, because, there are, you know, if you think of the American Civil War in the 1860s, they were photographs being taken there but if you think of the most iconic photographs often there's a mood to them and it might also be a combination of the elements that I've already spoken about but um, experimenting with mood does start to give your photographs more of a uh, more of a kick let's let's call it that but they have more impact and again it changes the experience that somebody will have when they look at it compared to if you did a basic snapshot and the final thing that made a difference for me, and I got this initially from portrait photography, learning from a portrait photographer. I kind of learnt it, but just with the work I was doing with her, it really emphasised the um, the importance of connecting with your subject, how you connect with the subject. And usually the best way to connect with the subject is to get their eye, just be really focused on their eye. The eye is really clear. Um the more you can see of the eye, so if you've got good lighting on their eye, you start to see the retina, the colour of the eye, all that kind of thing. And I think the stronger that is, the stronger the connection is with your subject. So 
if I'm shooting wildlife photography, uh, if I'm shooting animals, uh, obviously things like whales breaching, you can't really do that. But if I'm looking at land animals, I'll always focus on their eye. And I like to get down as low as I can. Even if I'm in a four-wheel drive, most people, um, if I'm in the vehicle with other people, uh, quite often I find less experienced people are standing up and shooting, you know, standing up through the roof. Uh, whether You've got those vehicles where you can shift, lift the roof up. There's a canopy which lifts up. Uh, they'll be up there photographing. So they tend to be shooting down at the subject, whereas I'll be on my knees <laughs> on the floor um, to get as low as I possibly can and then shoot from that angle. Because if you're on the same eye level as your subject, and it might be a smaller animal or it might be an animal that's sitting in the grass or whatever's going on, that is more powerful. Even looking up into the eyes is a different shot than most people will take. So even doing that... Um, it gives a, an opportunity to have a different way of connecting with that subject. Um, I guess another part of that as well, when you're you're looking at connecting with the eyes, then how you, again, bring in these other elements that I've been talking about, uh, the depth of field. So what is the depth of field around the eyes? So when I was photographing people, I would definitely be focused on the eye that was nearest to me. And then the depth of field I would set to be quite narrow, um, I'd like the tip of their nose to still be in focus. Otherwise, I find that starts to become a distraction. Um, but then behind that, where the eye is, so if you think of that distance between the um, uh, the sensor in the camera and the eye of the subject, that distance behind, I like that to be going out of focus relatively quickly. So that might be the back of the ears are going out of focus, you know, that sort of a distance. So... You need to think a little bit about how you're going to frame. You need to think about the distance that you're shooting from, the lens you're using, and what focal length, because all of these things begin to have, um, well, they will have an impact on what's in focus and what isn't when you start working with that that depth of field that I spoke about earlier. But if you can get all of those elements right, then I think you, you've you got a, a great palette, is the word that springs to mind. I'm thinking of you know how a... Uh, an artist, a painter, would put a certain palette together to have a great range of colours to get a great effect and mood and all of that stuff. Um, maybe think of it as a toolbox. If you understand these five things, so I guess just to recap, the first one is really understanding shutter speed and how you use that to create movement in an image or eliminate movement from it. So that shutter speed is really important for that. If you understand aperture, um, depth of field, how it affects the lighting, uh, because again, having something darker or lighter. So you might want to deliberately overexpose or deliberately underexpose an image to um, get a particular effect. Now, these days with post-processing, if you don't get it right the first time, it, it's not that important. If, you, if you're in the ballpark, if you're in the right area, then you can always tweak things in post-processing and you get quite a large range of things you can do in post-processing but again when I started and um, I was just shooting film you had to do everything in the camera you know when you press the shutter button that was basically the end of it all your cropping composition um, all of those things you did before you press the shutter button and while it's not really necessary these days post gives you a lot of opportunity it's probably not a bad thing to at least experiment with it if you do have access to an old film camera where everything's manual uh, it's good to just experiment with that or even do it on a, a digital camera, but do it, just try working in manual for a while. I don't recommend it as a way of using the camera in most situations. I think you need to use a mode, whether it's aperture priority or shutter priority or whatever it is. But if you do just experiment with manual, I think you, your understanding of the fundamentals and the, the relationship, particularly in the exposure triangle, um, so your shutter speed, your aperture and your, your sensitivity, you get a really good working knowledge of those how those things interact. And then when you come back to using the camera in the way you normally would, I think you'll find you're far more effective. You'll probably have a lot more confidence about it as well because you've just got that hands-on knowledge about how to get particular results. And then you can look at other people's work and you start to recognise how they've achieved a certain effect and then you can imitate that and then build on that. And um, to me, that's a great way of developing your photography and then I think you'll you'll find you get more inspired and then that inspires you to to go back and do more of that kind of thing so 
definitely understanding the exposure triangle but if you do have the time and the patience to just experiment in manual and it, it is as i say far easier with um digital cameras these days because you can shoot as much as you like and um as often as you like and and you, you'll learn much faster than in the days when i was doing it where you kind of had to wait for your for your, your uh, films to come back and then work out from the notes which was which and and what had worked and what didn't and the next time around you experiment and you kind of narrow down the things you're varying it. so your variables reduce but you start to get then uh, quite accurate you get quite good at getting a particular effect so that was the first two and then composition is is kind of a whole other thing so you can do composition in full auto but i think it limits you i'm i'm a big believer in understand the exposure triangle and then going from there because you just have access to the full creative potential of the equipment you're using. But com- composition you can do with anything, and, and definitely with smartphones, things like that. These are things you can apply straight away. So if you're not familiar with the rule of thirds, I would get familiar with it and use it as a starting point. Um, but there's Fubiachi, um, there's Fubiachi curve, I think that's right, was that numbers? <laughs> and they were very good on these things. But yeah, there, there's um, the golden spiral, those sorts of things. And I think that's Fubiachi. I'm, I'm sure I'll be corrected by somebody. Um, but the the golden spiral, which you find in nature, if you think of a um, snail shell and uh, various other things like that, that's a, um, a mathematical relationship uh, that you find in nature. And if you begin to... Um, put that onto your photography i was thinking a really good word to use there and then it went out it went away again i couldn't get it back so um imprint <laughs> that was what i was thinking of if you can imprint something like that on your photography and how you approach composition again you can shoot the same subject in a way that other people won't think of and that gives you suddenly that you're looking at something you're familiar with but you've got a really interesting photograph whereas there are lots of other photographs of the same subject and really pretty ordinary, you know, and they're all pretty much the same. So do experiment with composition. There's so much you can experiment with when you start getting into it uh, that it really is a great topic. And as I say, you don't need to get into the um, the technicalities of the camera. If you want to think of exposure triangle that way, you can do that without knowing all of that stuff. And then, as I've said, mood, uh, contrast and lighting, they start to take your I think this is where your photography definitely kind of moves into more of an art form because art to me is more about the connection that the viewer has with that piece of art regard whether it's a painting a photograph piece of music whatever it is that's where it becomes art because you start to create an emotional response in the viewer and there are techniques you can use to sort of, sort of steer them in a particular way. And once you understand those, you begin to, I think, elevate your work to another level where you um, start to put out work that has a lot of impact. And this is where if you look at really good photographers, the sort of well-renowned photographers, they'll tend to have, um, they'll produce certain results, but they tend to create an emotional response. It might be a happy response. It could be a thoughtful response, whatever it is. But they've they're starting to work they're working in that area where they they understand how to use different um different aspects of a photograph to create um a particular response so a couple of those you can think about a lighting and uh, and contrast and then finally how do you connect with your your subject because and i think it's particularly true with people i think the most powerful photographs when you look at somebody, you look at a photograph of somebody, a portrait of somebody, and you kind of feel you know them or you can see a certain aspect of them, something of their personality is in that look. And that that goes beyond um, what you're doing with a camera because in order to be a good photographer and get those kind of results, you really know how to work with people and get them to relax or how to put them in a particular setting where the whole image is is about them, their personality, or maybe what they've done. But that's also another different skill set. So it's about working with people. And I remember when I first wanted to get, or first started getting into um, photographing people, I'd have all this camera gear with me and it was great stuff. And I enjoyed all of that, but I really didn't know how to tell someone how to pose. I didn't know how to make them feel relaxed so that that came across in the, in the, the final image. And that's another another skill set that you can, again, spend um, a lot of time developing. Some people are naturally very good with people anyway, and that will tend to come out with them. But um, 
that's something else to just think about if that's an area that you want to get into when you start connecting with people not so much with animals because they kind of do their thing but if you want to do people portraits then you really do need to work on how to relax people and how to work with them so that the photographs you get look very natural and and then that creates the space for that that connection that personality to shine through the photograph so that is um it so hopefully you found that useful five things that i learned that made each of them made a very big difference to what i was doing in my photography at the time obviously these are different disciplines i'm talking some things kind of apply everywhere but other things are quite specific uh, but hopefully something in there has um given you some ideas or, or um, you know maybe um, inspired you to go and look up a few things and see what you can do and how you can apply um, certain aspects of this to your own photography so that's it for now I will speak to you again in the next podcast so bye for now I hope you enjoyed that podcast now if you did and um, you're interested in wildlife photography or really a basic introduction to photography I suppose My next free webinar is taking place on Wednesday, the 31st of January. That's at 7 p.m. Central European time, so Paris time. And um, it doesn't really matter if you can't make the live event because everybody who registers, so once you register, I get your email address. Uh, Once the webinar has finished, normally one or two hours later, um, you will get uh, um, an email from me with a link to the recording. So... Uh, If you're not able to make the live event, if you're in Australia or somewhere else, that shouldn't be a problem. So that's on uh, Wednesday, the 31st of January. And there's a link in the description. It's on Eventbrite and um, you can also find it on my website. So if you go to the website, you'll find the link there. Uh, And www.ge.photography should take you there. Okay, speak to you soon. Bye now.